All right, well, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we're taping this in the afternoon, but good evening as you're watching this. Um, and this is the beginning of a new series uh, that our student ministry is going to be doing every Monday. We're going to have what's called a video drop. It uh, should be somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, some weeks it'll be a lesson, some weeks it'll be an interview. Um, but uh, we'll also talk about those things Wednesday night at uh, our youth gatherings. So with that being said, I'm special guest uh, Dan Bailey. And uh, Dan, what's your official title here at the church, at EBC? I am dubbed the Pastor of Worship and Media Arts. All right. That sounds very, very sophisticated. It's a mouthful. It is. Yeah, man. Um, so let's just get to know you a little bit. What, uh, what, uh, tell us the story about how you came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Absolutely. Um, some of this is because I remember it, and other, other parts of it are because my mom actually wrote down the account. It was February 12th, 1987. Snap. Oh, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is a very exact rendering and recollection. Um, I was three, almost four years old. March 30th is my birthday, so I was upon four years old. And according to my mom, I was like asking deep spiritual questions, whatever that means for a three-year-old, in the last few months. And then one day we were all down in our basement as a family, and I just out of nowhere said to my mom, um, Mom, when I die, I don't want to go to heaven or hell. I just want to be with the family forever. A very, you know, sentimental thing for a three-year-old to say, you know, just wants to be with the family. And so my mom, who was spiritually sensitive to me at the time, was like, hmm, maybe I should take Daniel. That's what the, my family calls me, not Dan, but Daniel. Up, up to the living room, and we should have a private discussion. So she explained to me the gospel. And um, the angle on that that I remember the most was the passage from Isaiah where she, she talked about how uh, you can ask God for forgiveness through Christ and your sins, your heart will be as white as snow. She talked about how Jesus would come into my heart, um, that he'd clean it all up and make it as white as snow, just like Isaiah says. So I, as three years old, living in the St. Louis suburbs, bowed my head and asked Jesus into my heart. And a lot of folks talk about an early conversion like that as like not the real deal, but I really believe it was the real deal for me. And I do remember it as one of my earliest memories. As soon as I prayed, I jumped up. I started running around in circles in my living room around the couch. I was so excited and wanted to call my grandma. And I think even my dad was out of town at the time, so we called dad. And it was a joyous moment. But that really, I'm not going to say the next day I went off and like became a missionary or something like that. I was three. <laughs> Probably still uh, giving my younger brother a hard time and stuff, but um, that was definitely the moment I understood forgiveness through Christ. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know about you when I was a kid, and uh, they said, Jesus is going to come live in your heart. You know, me right. being the very literal kid, I was like, where? Like, you know, which ventricle, you know? Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus stint in there. Well, you did min min uh, mention ministry and missions. Yeah. Um, so... When did you believe that God was calling you to into ministry, and then you did spend some time overseas um, mm -hmm. as a missionary? Yeah, this this particular part right here could take an hour and a half if I wanted it to, so I'll give the condensed version. Um, call to ministry was definitely like a multi-phased thing. Um, in high school, I loved my youth group experience. It was actually in Liberty, Missouri, not too far from here. Had a great youth minister, and the way that he both spoke to us and also led us in worship really spoke to me as a musician, uh, introduced me to the music of Keith Green, which is very missional and just uh, extremely um, con just confronts your heart uh, in a way that, that is, is very strong, the lyrics that he writes. So during that time, I was just kind of taken with my youth minister. So my first phase was like I felt called to, to ministry maybe as a youth minister, but then as I developed as a high schooler with music and things, and I thought hmm, maybe like some form of music ministry, uh, ministry. so I, you know, applied and uh, did a vocal performance major at Wheaton College, and, but then in that, like, it was very classically oriented, mm -hmm. so um, the way that I, you know, learned to love music wasn't, I, I like classical music, don't get me wrong, but uh, my falling in love with music was, was more sort of on a contemporary level, so then there was theory and ear training and sight singing and all this stuff that was kind of sapping the, the natural passion for music out of me. I still credit those days as being an amazing foundation for going deeper in music. But somewhere there, like my junior year, I kind of almost had like a, a small depression where I was like, gosh, I love music, but I don't know if it's singing arias for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, 
And my junior year, I was also reading through the Bible and came to Isaiah and, and God's heart for the nations. Mm -hmm. It just kept coming up over and over again of how God was going to reach out to all nations. I was attending a church at the time that was very focused on missions and had missionaries coming through all the time, twice a year for these big missions fests. And at that time, sort of so, from wanting to be a youth pastor to some kind of music ministry to then missions, and God really called my wife and I, at the time we were uh, not married yet, but um, to really consider committing ourselves to overseas ministry. So that launched us into um, getting married in 2005, a couple years after that, starting on staff at a church, um, first as a children's minister, actually. <laughs> Any of you who are interested in ministry, it's, gonna, it's not going to be a linear path. Um, there are going to be a lot of interesting... Twists and turns. Unexpected twists here. and turns. So I started as part-time children's minister, then I became full-time worship minister. And then in 2013, we, we did go um, overseas and um, spent some time working there. Awesome. And uh, so have you always had a, uh, a passion for music, or did that start at a particular time? Was there a particular influence in your life or band or something that really just captured your attention? Yeah. Um, well, going way back... Uh, my, my mother insists that, as an infant at some point, that I would, I would rock in my infant chair to the beat. So apparently I was getting down <laughs> and kind of grooving at about, you know, five or six months old uh, to whatever Sandy Patty or whatnot that she had playing in the room. Um, then I just remember my entire upbringing. Um, of course, my mom was very musical and she would sing and stuff like that, so I'd listen to her and her music. And then... Uh, I would go off alone, like in, in places that were reverberant, like my garage, and I'd sing, like as a little kid. And then finally, just sort of the, the course of school took over. Uh, started in a band in sixth grade, playing the saxophone. Played that all the way through part of college uh, before I decided to focus more on voice. And taught myself the piano in eighth grade. A friend of my sister's came over and showed me just how to play major and minor chords. And I was like, I could play and sing at the same time with this. So. Uh, while I was more classically trained in voice and saxophone with piano, I totally taught myself. So don't hand me like Beethoven or something because <laughs> I can learn to play it if I, you know, tried for about a month and a half. But right, you know, I just kind of taught myself by ear and by chord to play piano. Um, and then all through high school, you know, singing, saxophone, choirs, plays, musicals, competitions, all that kind of stuff until I landed in college majoring in voice. So. That's a very quick summary of a long, yes. long path. Um, so tell us, um, how's maybe God been working in your life in the last year, let's say? Or let's yeah. say two years, even. Sure. That's about the time you've been at EBC, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll maybe a little longer than that. But. Yep, about two and a half years. Um, yeah, there are a lot of ways God's been working in my heart right now, just in the, in the last couple of years. Um, one is, we have four kids. Um, eight-year-old, five-year-old, three-year-old, and one-year-old. So that just that whole area of how to be faithful in the chaos, um, how to be a good husband and father, how to uh, to serve the church, and to uh, just to do my best in all areas of life. When you sort of feel like you're not able to do your best in any area of life because it's just lots of moving parts. So I think God's been just uh, teaching me to lean into Him in that and to. Kind of realize our humanness that we're not little gods running around we have a certain limit and a certain capacity and just to, to give each day to him and to do our best in each of those areas knowing that he has a ton of grace and a ton of patience with us another area and this probably just kind of applies more to the last three or four months is flexibility mm -hmm. um, and the ability to adjust uh, just sort of like never before from um, COVID-19 hitting to just sort of the, um, the stuff particular to EBC with, with our dear senior pastor, Dr. McAlpin's health issues, just a lot of adjusting and a lot of um, influx fluid situations. And just got, I've been somebody who in the past has struggled with perfectionism and wanting to get everything just right. So um, kind of in this phase of life, just realizing that you just got to go with the flow and, and uh, do your best day by day, give us this day, our daily bread kind of stuff. Uh, and then throughout that, too, with just EBC as a whole, responding just in prayer to Dr. McAlpin's situation, just, just a lot more reflection on God's providence and sovereignty, especially in the midst of suffering and hard things. So 
I could, I'm sure I could say a lot more. Those are a few things I've been sort of reflecting So he's on. doing a lot of things, right? Yeah, a yeah, lot yeah, of things. Yeah, a lot of things. That's typically how it works. You know, the older you get, the, the more uh, life throws at you and, and the crazier it gets. And there's, there's seasons where things are fairly calm, and then there mm -hmm. seems to be seasons where nothing is as you think it ought to be in some ways. Right. So, um, it pours, yeah, man. <laughs> so, um, one last ministry related question, then I have a silly question after that. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, how do you how do you view your role as a because you are a pastor, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people say, well you just do the music mm -hmm. right but that is a pastoral role sure you know I, I believe and, and and that you know how do you minister and what's your thoughts on ministering people through uh, the medium of you know music on Sunday with you know even your relationships with the the band mm -hmm. with you know uh, but also just from the stage to to the congregation yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I saw that question in advance, was thinking about another question that could have a whole seminar and hop on, but there are a few things that just initially popped into my mind. This is by no means uh, exhaustive, but kind of the most simple thought that came to my mind. We don't think about music in this way, but there are actually, in the Old and New Testaments, like commands for us as Christians regarding music. You know, I don't know if you've noticed those, but psalms that say, sing to the Lord. Right. Um, in, in the book of Ephesians, you know, be filled with the Spirit, singing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs in your heart to the Lord. So it's kind of a unique thing. As Christians, we are a people commanded to be musical. Um, sorry, you know, tone-deaf folks out there. Jesus loves you too. No, uh, I'm just joking. But um, no, really, singing to the Lord, lifting up our voice to Him. So on the very just, like, ground level, we're, we're commanded to, to praise Him, to celebrate Him, to sing. Um, but then I heard a saying once, I don't remember who said it also, uh, but that we actually tend to believe what we sing. Like, and so there's, we don't think of it this way either, but what we sing on Sunday morning is so important in terms of the theology that we believe. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, many times we, our, our beliefs are more in line with what we sing than, than what we hear uh, because there's this head-heart connection. So as a pastor, it's so important that we, we think through the songs that we choose, the mm -hmm. lyrics. Uh, I was at a conference once where they said, you know, if you could pull back sort of the cover on your congregation and see what's really going on in their hearts and their lives, make sure you're choosing music and lyrics that are going to nourish and minister to some of the, the needs and the desperation and the struggles that's going on there, you know. So I really take that seriously. I don't want to just, oh, I like this song. I don't like that song. Um, try not to pick fluff. I, I know that we could talk forever about people's preferences and that... Trust me, not everyone's happy with every, every song or, or, or things like that, but just know that there's a prayerful process in um, trying to feed the congregation through the music and also trying to balance a, a lot of things. Another thing that I thought about was just music has the uh, really unique ability to connect head and heart. Mm -hmm. You know, as Christians, we shouldn't just be people who are like, cerebral, I know all the right answers. Uh, we also shouldn't be people on the other extreme who are just tossed by our emotions. Um, but I do believe God um, desires that our affections be fully engaged in our life with Christ, that it's not just that we believe something in our head, but that, that Jesus is actually like our treasure, the thing we desire the most, and that music helps us connect what we believe through the lyrics to sort of this emotion through the songs that really helps us sometimes get to a place of feeling deeper, deeper love and affection right. and desire for God himself, which I think is, is what worship is all about, is to but him sort of as the crown jewel and the greatest pearl uh, in our lives, which, which involves our mind, our heart, our, our faculties. Um, and then just obviously uh, music and worship brings us back to the whole purpose for which we were created, you know, to worship God uh, as a worship pastor when we come together on Sunday mornings. The idea is to usher us into the presence of God, and that just takes us to, you know, why we were created, what heaven's going to be like, you know, to, to come before a holy God and to rehearse being in his presence um, and, and to fully delight in him. So that, that was maybe a little longer than I needed to go. I could say a bajillion other things about <laughs> that, but you're really helping people know God and to um, just engage themselves uh, in his presence. So Yeah, one of the things I want to go back to real quick is I, you mentioned it was this head and heart connection. Yeah. And... Um, you know, the the content of our lyrics matter because the mm -hmm. truth matters, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, at the same time, sometimes when we're seeing that truth, though, this, this uh, emotional aspect comes over you, this peace, mm -hmm. this understanding, this reminder sometimes about what God's doing in your life or right. some truth that you need to hear that week that mm -hmm. is true, but maybe you don't feel it. But then right. as you sing it, you, you know, it, it does impact us emotively as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, a little bit of, a lot of going on there, but... Both. I heard a, you just reminded me of a great example that I, I once read in a book about, you know, if, if it was your wedding anniversary and you came up to the door after work and your wife answered and you, you gave her a, a bouquet and, and maybe a card and she said, like, why did you do this for me? You just said, it is my duty to do so and I am obeying that duty. Your, your wife wouldn't really be too, uh, too impressed by that. But if you said, like, because I'm in love with you and, and uh, my heart desires to uh, please you and to, to grow this relationship. So, so there really is something to uh, obedience to God when it comes to where our heart is actually at and Him being, you know, our greatest treasure versus just, well, I'm just doing it because... Um, so God wants both, you know, uh, obedience and our heart to be aligned as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Dan does a great job here at EBC, and he also leads our student uh, worship band. So any students out there who are watching this and, um, you know, maybe have the, uh, some abilities or want to try something or maybe feel like God's calling them into a, a, a music ministry type of position in the future, I would encourage you just to reach out to Dan and uh, um, just, you know, pick his brain a little bit. Maybe grab a cup of coffee or whatnot and, uh, you know, just talk through some of those things. Because uh, we, we surely appreciate his work on Wednesday night leading the student band as well. Um, all right, so last thing. I know you're an impressionist. <laughs> so um, I want to hear your uh, Mrs. Doubtfire on uh, the camera. Well, I did, uh, I did enjoy watching Mrs. Doubtfire a lot as a kid. And, uh, for for uh, Chuck's ministry demographic, you might be like, what movie is that? But, uh, yeah, she, she uh, Robin Williams impersonated an Irish woman. Definitely, dear. Oh, little nose miners, go upstairs and do your homework, dear. So that's that's my uh, impression. Nice. And you might hear that around the office occasionally. You might, and many others. And then one last uh, one that I just uh, want you to, to touch on just for a minute is your uh, Mr. Trump, your Donald Trump, President Trump. Oh, I do. I guess I do do it. <laughs> I haven't done it in a little while. I've been trying to avoid the news recently. But, uh, anyway, that, uh, President Trump, Wrong, sorry, <laughs> excellent, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, if I had come up with an actual thing they said, it'd be easier to do the uh, impersonations. Yeah. Now they sounded great, and uh, <laughs> he's very quick witted with those things. So uh, we hope you enjoyed this time and getting to know Pastor Dan a little bit better. Um, this is uh, Pastor Chuck signing off. We'll talk to you later.